Good evening and went to, welcome to the Center for Applied Theology and the work of the Living Liturgy Forum. Tonight, I'm pleased to say that we are fielding a conversation on Egeria, a fourth century pilgrim to the Holy Land, um, whose experiences and observations uh, inform our understanding of everything from pilgrimage to liturgy at the time. And uh, leading us in this discussion is Patricia Kelly. So, Patricia, welcome. I'll ask you if you would please unmute. Thanks very much, James. So, um, we're talking about Egeria this week for two reasons. One is that we have hot off the press, well, maybe about six weeks ago, hot off the press. So, maybe warm off the presses of Brepols, um, the first edition in their new. Um, Library of Christian Sources, we have Paul Bradshaw's new translation of Egeria's journey to the Holy Land. And um, those of us who are familiar with the Holy Week liturgies of the Latin Rite Catholic Church are very familiar with the liturgies which Egeria describes as part of her journey to the Holy Land. So, before I hand over to Patricia Rumsey, who's going to colour in the little outline I'm about to give, two words. Egeria, about a fourth century, very wealthy lady, travels around the Holy Land. The only thing I regret with this wonderful book, and I have to say it's brilliant, it's beautifully produced. You've got Latin on one side and the English on the other. They map precisely to the end of the sentence. So there's none of that annoying nonsense where you turn a page in the Latin and the English is three, three pages behind. So it's beautifully produced. I just wish there was a map. So I had to have my map open on my iPad, but that's just because I'm a bit of a nerd like that. And I love maps. But she travels around the Holy Land and then she also gives an eyewitness account of the, um, of the liturgies in Jerusalem throughout the year and in Holy Week in particular. And as some of you will know, when the Holy Week liturgies were revised in the 1950s, we had a little bit of plagiarism going on because the great Monsignor who revised the liturgies essentially wrote with a copy of Egeria in front of him and rewrote the liturgies. And on that happy note of plagiarism, it's a good job we didn't have to turn it in in those days, I'm going to hand over to Patricia Rumsey who's going to fill in that, that colour a bit and talk about Nigeria in great detail. Patricia. The Thank you. Um, Patricia and I discovered earlier today that um, she thinks uh, she thinks Nigeria is a little bit odd. Um, I think she's just the most fantastic character imaginable, which doesn't preclude being a little bit odd, obviously. Um, she, we, we know very little about her but her personality comes through the letter that she wrote so strongly. Um, this letter, unfortunately, the beginning and the end are missing. And according to the letter writing custom of the time, that's where the, the writer would have told us a little bit about themselves, but it's not there. So we have to guess. And we think, could I have the first slide, James, please? Thank you. Now that is not a picture of Egeria because we don't know what she looked like. Um, that was me trying to put a face to a name. She might have looked something like that. She was a, a pilgrim in the fourth century, possibly from Spain, probably from Spain, but we can't be certain. She went to the Middle East and she visited just about every holy place Sinai, Egypt, um, what we call the Holy Land, Syria, Constantinople, and she spent a long time in Jerusalem, and she tells us a lot about the liturgy there. Was she a nun? Was she a laywoman? If she was a nun, it wasn't a nun as we understand nuns today. Um, but obviously she had a great interest in liturgy because she's constantly commenting on, well, this is how we do it, but this is different. Um, they sing the Kyrie eleison or they do something else, which is either the same or very different from us. Um, she comments, she's quite surprised how appropriate the Psalms are for the time of day. 
when they're using them at um, the liturgy, which I think would suggest that actually she was some kind of a monastic and more used to the monastic office where the Psalms were not arranged according to the time of day. They began at the beginning of the Psalter and worked their way through to the end. Um, so the fact that she's surprised about this could indicate that she's a monastic. Um, she wrote this letter, which is really more like a travel diary in Latin. As I say, the beginning and the end were missing. Um, it's only turned up in a monastic library in Arezzo in 1884. And since then, um, people have translated Egeria and read Egeria. Can we have the next slide, James, please? Thank you. That is a map of her journeying. She came from across the Mediterranean, from Galicia, which is probably part of Spain, um, Egypt, and then the Sinai Peninsula, and then um, Jerusalem, and then off up through Syria. She decided she wanted to go to Odessa. I, I think of her as a modern uh, travel guide delight because she always wanted to go on and see the next church to venerate the, the relics that she'd heard in such and such a place and to see what was on the other side of the next hill. Only once or twice does she actually say that she was tired. Um, presumably she was on the younger side to, to simply be able to cope with all that traveling. But then on the other hand, look at the Empress Helena who was supposed to have traveled all around that part of the world in her 80s. So maybe. Could we have the next slide, James, please? Um, some um, suppositions about her letter, her travelogue. We can roughly fix the date. It wasn't um, by any means uh, an academic treatise or um, anything theoretical. It was a chatty letter to people that she knew. She's constantly calling them sisters. Now, whether that was sisters in the monastic sense, whether it was simply Christian sisters that she knew back at home, or whether it was blood sisters, we don't know. Text was incomplete, beginning and end missing. It's a travelogue describing these holy places. Did she understand the language? Well, we don't know. She says herself that during the liturgical services, um, people that knew two or maybe three languages were doing a, um, a translation from Latin, from Greek to Latin or Syriac. Uh, the noise that must have been going on was, must have been very distracting. Did she leave out what was familiar, what she was taking for granted? Did she only comment on what was new? She was very, very interested in the liturgy, but her descriptions of actual worship are actually quite minimal. And she has this wonderful phrase, you know how inquisitive I am. Next slide, James, please. Thank you. Where did she worship? This is um, one end of the whole complex of Constantine's Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's the rotunda over Jesus' tomb. There's the courtyard. Um, where the arrow is pointing, there was the cross, a big jeweled cross, which they believed took the place of the cross of Jesus' crucifixion. They believed it was actually on Mount Calvary. And then to the right, there was the huge basilica, um, absolutely enormous, which reached right down to the main road through Jerusalem. So that's kind of the setting of where the liturgical worship was going on. Can I have the next one, James, please? A lot of things surprised her, how appropriate the psalms and the anthems were, the length of the services, which were absolutely enormous, what was different from what she knew, what was the same, and then the wonder and the magnificence of it all. She was very easily impressed, was our Egeria. Next one, James, please. What might surprise us when we read what she'd written the commitment needed to become a Christian. The catechumens had to sit through lectures by uh, the bishop, Cyril of Jerusalem, every day during Lent. He went through the whole of scripture from Genesis right to the New Testament. 
then the length of the services during Holy Week, the beginning of the process of the historization of the liturgy and the tension which was growing between holy places and everywhere is holy, which is a bit outside our remit for today, but it's interesting. There were so many different languages. And then the Eucharist is mentioned several times at different places where she stopped. She said, um, we had the offering made or we made the offering, but there were no details. And that reminds us that we're just not that long out of um, the, the time of, in some places, very bitter persecution in the church. The Eucharist was still something you didn't mention. You didn't go into details. And to show that, that she's still um, influencing today, that's a stamp that was issued in Spain in 1984 for the, I think, 1,600th anniversary of Egeria being in Jerusalem. So that is how they pictured Jerusalem, how they pictured Egeria traveling around on her donkey. Um, I think that's enough introduction. I'll pass on uh, to Rodney. I think. Okay. Uh, good. Good. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, I'm talking to you from Milan, Italy. Even though I did my PhD in Wales, so when you're uh, debating about the weather, then I I can uh, I can uh, add to that from my own experience. My I I, I come to the text in in a, in a couple of different capacities. One is my own research is on the uh, uh, Jerusalem pilgrimage text before the Crusades. And I, I focused a little bit more on slight, uh, a couple centuries later, uh, but Egeria uh, uh, and the fourth century sources set that up in the early Byzantine period for the type of pilgrim text that we read in the seventh, the eighth, and the, and, and the ninth centuries. The other way I come to the text is having worked in Jerusalem as the course director of St. George's College in leading and teaching pilgrim, pilgrim courses. And Egeria sticks with me as I talk to uh, the students who are, who are lay and clergy in terms of her excitement that she refers to several times. Uh, and that is the, the fact that scriptures are always appropriate. The hymns and scriptures are always appropriate to the time and place in which they are said in the different lit liturgies. And of course, we don't always know exactly what those are, but but the, the question is, if we're in the Holy Land, for instance, where do we commemorate the stories? You know, where, how important is that in terms of uh, did something actually actually happen? And I think Ajuria, uh, even though she's going to, she's being guided to places that have already been picked out on the ground, there are still scriptural traditions that we may be unclear of. And I think her, her whole idea that we commemorate things in appropriate places, whether or not they actually may be the exact place, I think gives us a lot of, of, of ways of, of going, going forward. The other thing is, in, is, is just the, orig the religious imagination that, that comes through in any text like this, as, as I was reading that this, this afternoon, and I, I'm, a, I'm writing a, 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 devo a worship devotional for, for the Iona community for, for Pentecost. And so, for instance, I was very interested in the, uh, the, the, the liturgy in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, because what they do after they go to the Church of Holy Zion, which is the traditional place of where Pentecost happened, is they go back up to the Mount of Olives and they commemorate the Ascension. And I just think, of course, that's not what the biblical text says, that the text would say that they... Pentecost took place 10 days later. But I mean, I just love that. I love that religious imagination that's there. I can't explain why they're doing that. But the idea that we know we don't really have a gap between 10 days between when Jesus left and the Holy Spirit came. But we can kind of have our cake and eat it too, that we're going to celebrate Pentecost. And then we're all going to go up the Mount of Olives and, and, and commemorate the Ascension. So any of these texts like Ageria is going to give us a different way of thinking, a different way of putting together uh, uh, scriptural stories. Uh, since, since we are talking about Holy Week, 
Okay, let, let me just make kind of a kind of a general point as we're talk, it, talking about the commemorations in the Holy Land. And I don't know how many of you have actually been there. But when we're talking about the actual events of the Passion, so Jesus uh, arrest, uh, his, his arrest and betrayal, especially the trial, and then his crucifixion. These are the commemorations more than any other Christian commemorations in the Holy Land that have moved around over the centuries. If you go there today, then you have the Via Della Rosa that's starting from what's now the Muslim quarter and, and going to, to, uh, to Calvary, approaching it from the east. Uh, but without getting into a lot of detail, which I could if you want me to answer, uh, the location of Caiaphas's house and uh, 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 where Pilate was. These are things that actually moved uh, more, more than once. Uh, in fact, where we would commemorate Jesus' trial before Pilate has, has, has moved at least twice. There's at least uh, three traditions at, at different uh, times. But I guess the, the last thing I want to say about the Egeria before I just uh, turn, turn it back over is I do think we need to approach the text by what it says rather than what it doesn't say. And the reason I say that is because we do know parts of the text are missing. And so what it does give us is this wonderful window into the actual liturgy of Jerusalem. I mean, that's a positive piece of the puzzle that it gives to us. But among the things it does not give us, which I would bet was part of the original text, is actually her original walkthrough of the city of Jerusalem. What we have is her talking about the liturgies. What we never get is her actual description of the topography of Jerusalem. And in, in, in many ways, you know, that, that's very much missing from the text. And because it's not in there, when we compare her to, to what we might call just traditional pilgrimage text before the Crusades, then it really becomes an outlier because some of these topographical details are not in there. For instance, the earliest text is from the Bordeaux Pilgrim who was there in 333, so about uh, 50 years before her. And it's a very modest, very short text. But if you just look at the amount of different places in Jerusalem that that text mentions, it mentions actually uh, uh, quite a few more than Nigeria does, like the, the Bull of Bethesda, uh, the Cave of, of, of Gethsemane, and, and some others. So I do think that's probably missing from the text. And I would put what we have from Nigeria closer to some other fourth century texts like Serial of Jerusalem, uh, Eusebius, and describing uh, uh, the liturgy of Jerusalem describing that. Of course, we do get a lot of her as just a religious traveler through the region. Uh, but it does read differently than the other pilgrimage texts, which are very much focused on, on locations and, and what's there. And I think the other question to ask about some of these texts is, that, does the author describe a biblical past? In which case, Ageria may be doing that when she does describe things. Or does the, does the author describe exactly what is there today, right now? And certainly when we get to the 6th, 7th, 8th century texts, it's very clear that even though they know this is where something happened based upon scripture, what they're actually giving you are the details of what, you know, what's on the altar and, and, and what the church is made of and, 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 and some of these. And so I think uh, when we read some of these texts, uh, its relationship to the biblical past is, is one of the questions that we can ask. So I know I've said some things there that I could expound upon, but let me just turn, turn, turn it back over for now. Rodney, that's super. Thanks ever so much. And thank you, Patricia Rumsey, for introducing Egeria to us so fully. One of the things that um, came to mind, actually, when you were both speaking, it came to mind separately, was the way that Egeria as she goes round, less so when she's in Jerusalem, but she goes to Mount Sinai and they have the readings of the 
um, oh, thanks, James, we've got the map. I love maps. Um, she goes to Mount Sinai and they, they have the readings of Exodus, of the Theophanies of Exodus and of the giving of the, of the law. And then she heads over to Mount Nebo, which I think is somewhere above modern day Amman. Um, and there they have the readings um, appropriate. And then she heads up to where Elijah is supposed to be from and they have some readings from there as well. So she's really interweaving the, the biblical accounts with the scriptures and the scriptures and the places in a very, very rich way, I suppose. One of the things we talked about earlier today with um, Patricia and I, Patricia Rumsey and I, when we were thinking about how to, how to go about this was the fact that they are really only 50 years after the, um, I guess we can, we can lose the map now, beautiful though it is, um, we can lose it. Um, that it's really, it, it's only 50 years or 60 years since Constantine when she's there. So, I mean, it is only two generations that Christianity is actually legal. And in the middle, of course, they've had Julian the Apostate. So they've had that, and that was in the East and not in the West, I think, wasn't it? So they've had a persecution in Jerusalem. Because the other thing that is striking is, never mind Holy Week, just how much time they spend in church in Jerusalem any time of the year. They're constantly going up to a church to say the Psalms. It's just, and it's that sort of glorying in the scriptures, but also in the fact that they can publicly, publicly worship, I suppose. I wondered if either of you wanted to pick that up a little bit. I think when I've been reading Ageria, one of the things that that always strikes me is the amount of, of uh, processions they make. They always seem to be walking from here to there. Um, they think nothing of walking from um, the great church in Jerusalem up to the top of the Mount of Olives and then back again and then to another church. It seems that that, that Christianity as, as Egeria knew it there was constantly on the move as well as spending hours and hours in church for the services, they were forever going to the appropriate place to celebrate what what was going on. I don't know whether Rodney wants to say a bit more about that. Um, one of my first points I actually meant to make in terms of her legacy today is the fact that this, this whole idea, so this was certainly what we did when I was at St. George's College, in Jerusalem was actually reading scripture at the site uh, is a huge part of, of, of the tradition today. And I could hardly think about doing a, a, a walk through the Holy Land today without doing that. And I would think if you're even even going by yourself or with, with one other person, let alone a group, you should do that. And I can, I can remember one of my uh, very first groups that I led through and we were at, we were at Capernaum. And if you could just imagine all the scriptures that relate to Capernaum, and uh, uh, and we were we there's a lot to go through there. You might only be there for an hour, and I can remember the disappointment, the, the the visceral disappointment of one pilgrim because we did not read John six, which is the, the well, I think it's John six, but the the one about bread and manna at the very end. It says where well, he said these in the in the synagogue at Capernaum. And, you know, I, before then, I wouldn't have thought of it as a, being a big scripture that relates real, to the context. But I just say that to say that even today, I think this, this desire uh, to have scripture, that experience of text and place is, is very strong. And it certainly just goes with all of this about the, whether it's processions, walking, but, but the religious practice uh, out there out in the Holy Land. And of course, that is exactly what we do in our congregations. We just transport those ideas back. So even if we're talking about the Holy Land, uh, this is exactly the same commemorative practice that we do in our own uh, own parish, uh, parish churches. Thanks. Um, James, I wonder whether you might talk a little bit about what Egeria tells us about the Eastern. I know that you don't have Easter for another two years. Well, no, that's not true, but for another two months, virtually, you might tell us a little bit about when your Holy Week comes. Mm. Is Egeria equally influential as she has been on the West? 
Well, very much so. I mean, in reading Egeria, I am struck immediately by how real what she is describing feels from a Byzantine point of view. I mean, the length of time she's talking about spending or observing sort of the, the, the unfolding liturgical life of the church is something that I think every Orthodox priest would recognize. And, you know, we, we might do so with a smile on our face or, you know, sort of shaking knees. Um, in fact, after our meeting earlier today in, in discussion around what we might um, uh, talk about regarding this presentation, I went back and I looked at my schedule for Great and Holy Week, um, extending back the year before we had uh, last lockdown or last year's lockdown. And I counted the hours and think that we were in from Palm Sunday to Bright Monday um, in church for at least 28 hours. Um, and that, you know, it, it sounds like an incredible chore for those who, who appreciate the words of every psalm. It, it's not, in fact. I mean, I'm not going to be pious about it, but the fact is, it's something that if you allow yourself to, to sort of hear what's going on, it really is extremely rich. And, and that's something that Egeria uh, draws on. I mean, what she is describing is something that, you know, very much uh, I think would resonate with Orthodox practice. Um, so the length of time, there are also structural parallels. Um, I can't remember which paragraph it is, but when she's talking about um, liturgy in Jerusalem and she describes uh, the entry of the clergy into the cave. And, um, and she, she mentions how the bishop offers prayers first um, for the faithful. No, it's not prayers for the faithful, it's special petitions. And then uh, prayers for the catechumens and then prayers for the faithful. That is of course, exactly the structure um, after, the, after the recitation of the gospel at Divine Liturgy. We have the the litany of a fervent supplication in which petitions, uh, special petitions um, can be inserted and are inserted, uh, following which there is the litany of the catechumens and the dismissal, uh, catechumens depart. Finally, um, the, the litany of the faithful. And uh, I mean, there must be, I, I'm no liturgist, uh, but there must be you know, something in that in terms of the, the pattern set down in, in, in Nigeria. I wonder, could I come in just for a second there? And, uh, yeah. uh, I've, been, I've been fascinated by Nigeria since 1977. And every time I, 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 I was trying to tot up while Rodney was speaking, how many times I've, I've gone through the text because I keep forgetting it. But each time I forget it, I dig out something completely new. And it's actually happened again tonight, listening to listening to the two Patricias and Rodney. Uh, uh, this is something that, that that is true not only about not only about um, Egeria, but it's true of the Bordeaux pilgrim. I will bow to Rodney's expertise. I think it's true of the Piacenza pilgrim. It's certainly true of the Scottish pilgrim, Arculf. And again, I'll hand over to Rodney for whether it's tr true of for Willibald. But a, I, the, I was reading Egeria uh, in Heptaphagion, uh, up, uh, you know, the, the, the Benedictine monastery up at, on the lake. Uh, on the on the lake for whose whose little famous little bowl of things is our logo um bowl of the two the fish and, and the loaves is our logo and if you go into any place in the holy land today there is the latin place that happens and then there is the greek place that happens and then there is the ethiopian place that happens uh, and the, the, the Holy Sepulchre, of course, is, is, is Tantarara, because even though they try to get on with one another, particularly now since the Israeli, nothing has pr promoted ecumenism in the Holy Sepulchre so efficiently in the last thousand years as the fact that the Israelis are now charging them for their water, and they actually all have to agree on something. Um, 
to avoid paying the tax. Uh, but when you read Egeria, you realize that there's only one liturgy in every place and they all just join in. Mm. And uh, if, she, if a later Latin pilgrim would have, would have got exactly the same Latin liturgy that the Franciscans were using everywhere else, uh, a Russian liturgy, a Russian gets a Russian liturgy, a Greek gets a Greek liturgy. And if the Ethiopians are gonna, uh, have got a little toehold, they get a bit of Ethiopian liturgy. But the curious thing is that she has to just join in. There's only one liturgy. And because there's only one liturgy, uh, she has to, she, she sees things she would never have seen. And she certainly wouldn't have seen them it's, it's irrelevant whether she came from Spain or Gaul uh, because the liturgy would have been more or less the same in each place. So she discovers all these things and is able to say, as Patricia Rumsey pointed out, you know, they do it this way precisely because she's not able to go into her own private Roman liturgy. And the other interesting question is that we all assume that it seems to be pretty certain that Greek speakers from Alexandria could understand Greek speakers from mainland Greece. Uh, and the best proof of that is, of course, famously uh, 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 Paul. Uh, but we know that Latin speakers from North Africa at this time, exact time, can't understand the Latin that's being used in Milan and the Milanese laugh at Latin pronunciation. St. Augustine has to learn Milanese pronunciation. So already the breakup into the Romance languages is beginning and you're getting, it's not yet proto-Spanish or proto-anything, it's, it's late Latin. Uh, they don't know it's late Latin, but it is, it's beginning to become late Latin uh, and, and, the, and, and the, lengths, the lengths of the vowels are changing. And also the definite article is coming into Latin. And you can see all that happening in Egeria. And again, she just muddles in. There's something delightful about the way she does. She must have been a real pain in the neck because she's, she must be using broad Spanish vowels or broad Gallican vowels when she's, so she will say mos rather than mas. And, you know, quare mos est in hoc loco. What do you do? What's, what's your custom in this bit? Whereas she should have said is query mos. And, uh, you know, she must have been a real pain in the neck. But the lovely thing is they, they, they tolerate her and she just muddles in and she must have been, you know, plowing through Greek. Uh, there must have been a lot of liturgy still in Syriac. And she's just plowing through the whole thing. And I think it's absolutely delightful. I love it. Trisha, do you want to respond to that? But she's a real pain. <laughs> well, I can I can follow that definitely in her pronunciation. Um, I I just find her I find her amazing in her enthusiasm for all that's going on and for wanting more and more and more. Um, she's never satisfied. Um, oh, hello, Puss. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. she, as I say, she always wants to see what's over the next hill. She suddenly decides she wants to go off to a church in Odessa because mm -hmm. she's heard that there are relics there that she wants to, to venerate. Um, it all sort of... It, it illuminates her background in that she doesn't seem to have any time uh, limit at all. She's not expected home by such and such a time. Um, she seems to be wealthy enough that it, it doesn't, there's no problem about presumably hiring pack animals and um, guards for the journey and all this kind of thing. And it doesn't seem as if she's got any family ties that would require her to be back home. So, um, it, it just makes more question marks about Egeria, but at the same time, I think, makes her into a more fascinating character in her own right. Pain in the neck or not. Yeah. I think she could have been an awkward customer, but she's clearly very well connected. 
Oh yes, yes. Talking about her entourage and her soldiers and yeah, to get to Edessa even and, and yeah, so, I mean yeah. it's right right out in oh, well, virtually the back of beyond. But she obviously knows all the right people, which strings to pull to get herself there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rodney, do you want to come in a bit there? I, I can comment a little bit that that, that Tom mentioned, uh, and then he and I have both have marveled at a couple of texts that were actually written in the early Islamic period, so in the seventh and eighth century, mm -hmm. where these texts do not they're the Latin Christians, so they do not talk much about the Greekness of other Christians, and they don't really speak much about the Muslim presence either. So the whole point is. And this is true of pilgrims and religious travelers too much, maybe, is people, you know, kind of kind of see the world through their own eyes. But but the, but uh, uh, we don't see as much that we would expect in some of the Latin texts in terms of talking about the the Greek liturgy. But uh, t Tom spoke about the uh, eventual uh, expansion of liturgies that we might see today, where everybody does their own liturgies. But the one thing that has not changed, and this is what we would pick up in the early bits of the Egeria text, is even though we now live kind of in a holy, holy land, even with Protestants, that everybody wants to do their own liturgies, their, their Christian tradition is extremely strong on the ground in terms of the traditional place of where something happened. And in fact, where you get sites that are contested, namely the Holy Sepulchre, they are fighting over the fact that they all believe it happened at the same location. And when you, also throughout the Holy Land where you get the Greek church and the Latin church side by side. And so if you just go through the Holy Land for the first time, you think there's a lot of, of, of divergence in terms of and competition in terms of location. And it's actually the opposite. Uh, and and the, uh, the Franciscans are, are very much this case that they will recognize a traditional location that goes back centuries and centuries. And they will say, well, that is where it took place, but they may have a property as close to it as possible. And what you have are a lot of dedications, but uh, uh, Greek, Latin recognize the same location. So there are always are some exceptions. Uh, a few sites do move over the centuries, like I said, if a church gets destroyed for some reason, and kind of the quintessential alternative site that's been developed in the last 200 years is, you know, is, is the Protestant, Protestant site of the, of, of the, of the garden, garden tomb, uh, which uh, there are probably some factors that led to that that are not so publicly uh, uh, stated in, in, in so much as just Protestants don't have a place to worship for the, for the, for the resurrection. That's a whole different story. But what I want to, want to say is that there's a tremendous sense of tradition in the Holy Land in terms of locations, whether or not that's actually biblical, you know, actually accurate or not. But the idea of liturgies uh, of, uh, that Tom said is, is, is now quite, quite diverse. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments or observations or are you all rushing to buy the book? Could I just make one more um, observation before everybody else uh, jumps in? And I think it's very interesting. We see Egeria coming to um, the Holy Land and the whole of that part of the world. And then we see her going home again, presumably taking with her all that she's seen and learnt and experienced where she was. In the early, some of the early Irish monastic texts, they talk about having prayer at the cross, the, the big Irish high crosses. And that is exactly what they were doing at the cross, what they believed to be the cross in Jerusalem. 
And I think that's how we see tradition spreading out from Jerusalem. People went there on pilgrimage, then they went home. And because Jerusalem was so important, it was always at the center of, of early maps because it was the most important place in the world. And so they wanted to take home with them what they'd seen happening there. And we see it, as I say, in as far west as you could get in those days in Ireland. Um, so I think that's another aspect of um, not just Egeria personally, perhaps, but pilgrims generally. They took home with them what they saw happening in Jerusalem. Patricia Kelly, I'm wondering, uh, especially while we still have Tom here, if and, and, and actually Patricia Ramsey, you might uh, be able to speak to this as well. But I'm just thinking about uh, sort of the diversity of liturgical practice really across the Mediterranean world at this time. We're talking about the latter half of the fourth century and uh, Tom and Rodney's alluded to it as well. Um, that is the, spoken of the diversity of, or the potential diversity of services uh, as they might have unfolded where Egeria went. And I'm wondering what that sort of looks like, at least broadly speaking, in the sense that you know, we've mentioned Syriac, we've mentioned Greek, we've mentioned Latin, and it's easy enough in our minds to, you know, conceive of the Syriac family, the Byzantine family, the Coptic family, etc., of liturgies. But what does it look like at this point? I mean, I've spoken now to the, you know, modern Orthodox practice, but just as sort of a, a reflection on, on how, um, you know, what was happening then might relate to uh, somebody today. What did it look like then? I think that's a question for Tom and Patricia Ramsey. Well, which of us wants to go first? You go, Tom. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm looking at um, John Griffiths there, and we were both taught by a, a literatist called Brian McGee. Um, and McGee, McGee, McGee used to shock students 40 years ago by saying something that we would now take as utterly obvious because it's, he was say, you know, he was actually saying this twenty years before, before Paul Bradshaw was saying it, and that is that diversity is the rule of liturgy, not unity. Um, he he was always struck by the fact that the liturgy is just so diverse. Uh, in in. Um, in the West, liturgy does not develop a public uh, face for centuries before it develops it in the East. And that is because the public face of liturgy, remember, if let's assume she came from a, a coastal town in, in Spain. There's, there, you know, Saragossa, right? Cesar Augustana was big, a big entrepot, uh, stuff is coming all the way across the Mediterranean and through there is going, is, is being diffused all the way across to, to Portugal. Uh, the, the, the finest wine is coming, is coming then as now from the Douro and it's going out into the Mediterranean through that port. So um, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's not for nothing that uh, the Latin liturgy celebrates the Eucharist with sherry because it's it's all to do with these ports, um, and uh, but they would never have seen public liturgy because public liturgy until well into the fifth century is still the liturgy of the local temples. So there would have been a temple to Mars, which would have had all the military stuff done at it. There would have been a temple to Jove, which would have been sort of civic rites. There would have been a, a, a temple to Venus, which would, would be the equivalent of um, a statue of Joachim and Anne in a later Catholic church. And there will be then three or four local temples. In fact, there may have been, there may have been, they may have been celebrating a public Roman liturgy for the, for, for the, the, the great march around the town at the, uh, you'll remind me how the Feast of St. Mark is. Um, 
on what is the same day as our feast of St. Mark and became in the Latin rite then the greater and lesser litanies, they literally marched around the town to dispel all the evil spirits from the town. So public liturgy would have been very much still the pagan liturgy. Christian liturgy would have been very much an in-house, very private affair. And what happens in, in the East is that with the consecration of Constantinople, uh, which is consecrated both to the pagan gods, like Constantine is a, does not, you know, he, he's not an exclusivist. He, he dedicates Constantinople both to the pagan gods and to the Christian gods. And if he'd found out about anything else, he would have, he would have, he would have had it consecrated to them as well. He, he begins the process in Constantinople of a public Christian liturgy. Uh, so for instance, um, it's in Const it's that's why it's Constantinopolitan uh, court dress that is behind uh, what clergy both East and West wear still today. Uh, so she, when, when she gets to Palestine and she sees this glorious public liturgy, this may have been this may have been literally coming in from the sticks. She may never have seen uh, anything like such public liturgy in Spain. I think too that there's also the aspect that liturgy was nowhere near as cut and dried um, at that time. I mean, we, we all know which feast days come when and how we celebrate and what we do. Um, but the whole calendar was still developing. Um, and I think it's just probably a little, little bit before Algeria. There's this sudden explosion of, of public worship when Christians found themselves free to worship in public after the era of, of persecution. And all of a sudden there are, there are new feasts being put forward. There are new liturgies being um, developed. Um, all of a sudden, as I say, it, it all just explodes. Whereas before, as Tom said, it, it was very, very much a, a private, what you do at home. And it is still private, isn't it? I mean, as you said about the Eucharist, Patricia, mm, mm. she doesn't, she either says they do it as we do, or she says they don't do it as we do. Mm. But she doesn't say what, no. what we do. She doesn't say what it is. No. Um, and she doesn't say what the differences are, uh, which is very inconsiderate of her. Really. <laughs> um, Frank Callis has asked a very good question that she was traveling, uh, she was traveling through the Roman Empire as it reached its ultimate end. Is there any awareness of that she's at that pivotal moment? Uh, that's a fascinating question because, of course, we read her as late antiquity um, or we read her as patristic period or we read her as proto-medieval we put her into boxes she, she she didn't even know how many she had only have the vaguest idea of what date it was mm -hmm. in terms of of ad dating because the ad dating hadn't been hadn't been hadn't been formally fixed she would have still been measuring it in the regnal years of the Latin emperors. And that's one of the reasons why we have trouble dating it. She didn't, she never then said, you know, in the following year, um, uh, on the 2nd of January, 328 or so, she doesn't, she doesn't think like that. And while we think of her as, as a, someone who's at the, 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 she really, she really thinks the Roman emperor, The first person who is on record of thinking the Roman Empire might be on its way out is a Spanish bishop called Erosius, and he is at least a generation after her. So it's a little bit like meeting someone who was born in 1945, as opposed to someone who was born in 1900. In 1900, someone born in Britain 
thinks the British Empire will last forever. In 1945, they're already thinking it's at the end. The other thing is that uh, in, in the late fourth century, we think of the Roman army as, as, as being, um, you know, we still borrow that dreadful line from Gibbon, you know, they all became lazy and unmanly and they didn't fight hard enough and they're not, you know, you know, this sort of 19th century uh, muscular Christianity. Uh, the Roman army was, 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 was building, a, a, right at this point, the Roman army was building a series of massive forts out in the middle of the desert and getting ready to have a war with the Persians. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Roman army doesn't ever become inefficient. It just becomes overwhelmed. If you're faced with loads of muck savages coming in from Germany, they are really going to overwhelm you. you just, there's just no way. Um, like they, one, one, one could read the, uh, one could read, in case you think that's an anti-German comment, I'm thinking of the letters from Vindolanda uh, up on, up on, the, up on the, uh, the north coast of, uh, the, uh, up at the north of Northumbria, where they're worried about people, my ancestors coming in and beating them up. Uh, and they just, you know, there's just that, that plaintive cry, the food is bad, the beer is weak, and they just, they, we just don't have enough troops. The, 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 you, you, the, 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 the Roman army is overwhelmed. It never stops being a highly efficient military instrument. And she knows that. So she has every confidence it'll last forever. I think we've got a question from Anne Inman. Anne, do you want to, you don't want to speak. You want me to raise it for you? No, I'm quite happy to speak. Um, I was thinking, when Egeria travels round, when she's in Jerusalem as a pilgrim, she will be with lots of other pilgrims and they are very, their whole life really is about, at that time, would be about being the pilgrim. So they would have these very long services and that. But that can't have been the same for the Christian communities of that time in other places. Um, they must have had shorter liturgies for a start because, you know, we've all got other things to do. Um, now, I think perhaps, um, Patricia, you answered that. You said she didn't talk about any differences, but I wondered, I was wondering before you said that, whether she had talked about the differences. Oh, I see. She doesn't. She talks about the Jerusalem liturgies in detail, whether it's the offices during the day or whether it's then the Holy Week, but she doesn't, for instance, when she goes out to Edessa uh, or even at Mount Sinai where she's with the what becomes the monastic community there, she's not really discussing in great detail. I'm looking at Patricia Rumsey. I know she can't see that I'm looking at her, but I am. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as opposed to any other. Any other she, she does say when she's talking about um, Holy Week in Jerusalem, she says things like um, people go home now for a short rest. Mm. Uh, and you think, well, they must have been absolutely dead on their feet because they've been in church for something like 13 or 14 hours. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know whether you can actually prove this but I think the the services were that long even in Jerusalem and people perhaps tended to do rather like they do in in orthodox churches today um sort of drop in and drop out um but obviously they were expected to to drop in and stay in if if Egeria was anything to go by well of course um, she doesn't have anything else to do does she no she hasn't got a home to run because well she's staying somewhere mm, mm. Um, and I think the feeling is that uh, during Holy Week the services were long and you were expected to be there. That's what I say. What amazes me is the amount, the, the degree of commitment required to be a Christian in those days. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I just have a, I have a, I have a quick point, and this comes from a later text, but I think it applies for her. At, 
the whole idea uh, that we don't have the luxury of is somebody's going to be there, they're going to be there for three years uh, instead of us being there for 10 days. And so we have other pilgrims that we know were there for nine months or, or certainly several months. And they're always making sure that they're at the right place at the right time. Of course, they're going to be at the Jordan River for, for Epiphany. They're going to be in Bethlehem for Christmas. They're going to be in Jerusalem for, uh, uh, for, for the Passion and Holy Week. And of course, we're talking about all of these special Holy Week services. But I just want to make the point from certainly a 8th century text that I looked at. But it's going to be true for Ajaria being in Jerusalem more or less three years because she's going other places is it doesn't even matter if it's a high festival or not they're doing this stuff every single day yeah. you know they there might still be another site to see but I think what developed a bit later than the jury was was a, a Jerusalem circuit where you'd basically go from from the holy sepulcher to Mount Zion mm -hmm. and eventually up to the uh, Mount of Olives and it was not tied to the to the annual to the to the seasonal liturgy i mean it's just something people would do every day there's no question they're doing stational devotions which are mentioned in a couple of the places in nigeria like when they go out to uh, lazarus's tomb and they stop and they do a station where martha where uh, was it martha met, met, met jesus yeah they did the same one coming down the hill on on uh, where, where Jesus prayed in, in Gethsemane. So these type of things that they would certainly be praying, perhaps even individually. But, but my point I want to say is these pilgrims are there for several months and they're just, they're, they're repeating it. They're doing it, I, I believe, just over and over and over. So they know, they know Jerusalem well by the time they leave. They certainly do. <laughs> And there's another question about um, whether it was safe for a woman traveling um, in that part of the world, but she wasn't traveling on her own. She was part of a, of a pilgrimage party. She always saying, we did this and we did that. I don't think she indicates just how large that party was, but presumably they would have had their own guards with them to, to um, keep them safe. But she certainly wasn't traveling on her own. And one time she was identified with Gaia Placidia. I mean, not seriously or for very long, but she was identified with Gaia Placidia, wasn't she? So who was the sister of one emperor? And the... That's right. It's not but, what you know, it's who you know. Yes. <laughs> so she's she's traveling with an entourage or a, mm. or a pilgrimage or, yeah, mm. she's not. She's not on her little, on a little Todd with a teddy bear. Mm. Um, <laughs> This brings us to uh, 8 p.m., which is uh, an hour on the button. And I have to say, I've found this entire discussion, uh, frankly, riveting. I'm uh, delighted with all of the input that we've had in the discussion it's engendered. Those of you, I remind you, uh, who have been here uh, participating but have not necessarily asked something, if you want to, please feel free to follow this up on the, on the forum, on the website. Um, equally, of course, I think probably all of us are happy to field questions. Uh, uh, you know, we're here precisely because we love conversing around these, uh, these issues and, and personages. Um, Egeria, I think if it's uh, left me with anything, it's a desire to desperately return to pilgrimage, uh, especially uh, once uh, lockdown has eased up. I expect uh, many of us are feeling the same way. But hopefully uh, you've all found that a uh, helpful um, meditation uh, as we uh, start off Holy Week, at least those of you who are in Holy Week have started it off. And uh, we look forward to getting together once again partway into April uh, to discuss uh, Easter. So thank you all for being here. God bless you all. And we look forward to being together next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and found it somehow informative, please be sure to click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would also love it if you visited the center on the web at www.appliedtheology.org.uk and took out a membership. At £20 per year, your membership is one of the main means of support on which we depend to carry out our work. Finally, look for us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just do a search for the Center for Applied Theology. We look forward to having you join us.